Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 345, recorded May the 4th, 2018. Robert Curson. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. Stop crime before it happens and make your neighborhood safer with Ring. Go to ring.com slash triangulation and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit. And by FreshBooks, the ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software helping small business owners thrive. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation. I am Megan Maroney filling in for Leo Laporte. And today I am very excited to talk to Robert Curson. Robert Curson is the best-selling author of Shadow Divers, which was the true story of two Americans who solved one of the last mysteries of World War II. Curson has also been an attorney, although he asked me not to remind him of that. He is a award-winning journalist whose stories appeared in Rolling Stone, The New York Times Magazine, Esquire, and other publications. And most recently, he is the author of Rocket Men, The Story Behind Apollo 8. Thank you so much for joining us, Robert. Oh, so such a pleasure and honor for me to be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So every person that I talked to that about this interview, I said, you know, he wrote this book about Apollo 8. And everyone's like, Apollo, which one was that? I know 11, I know 13, I'm familiar with one. Um, so tell us about what, uh, how you got interested in writing about Apollo 8. Well, I was uh, showing some friends through the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago here, where I live. And the museum, it's a world-class museum, and it happens to have the only U-boat in North America. I think there are five U-boats remaining, German U-boats, and uh, just one in the United States, and it's in Chicago. So I was showing friends that U-boat because it's a perfect match for the U-boat I wrote about in my first book, Shadow Divers, which told the story of two recreational scuba divers who find a sunken U-boat lost in New Jersey waters with 56 dead German sailors inside. And so I was uh, giving them a tour of that U-boat. And when we left, I kind of turned left instead of right. And as I get older, I'm realizing just how much luck and fate plays into life and the world. So I took a, a left instead of a right, and I came across a space capsule that looked um, to have come from both the past and the future. It was wild. And it looked battered and bruised from wherever it had gone. And I read the placard and it said, this is the Apollo 8 command module. And I was just like people where you are. I knew about Apollo 11, which is man's first landing on the moon, and about Apollo 13, in which an explosion near the moon uh, made it almost a uh, disaster, a tragedy, and the, the uh, crew almost didn't make it back. But I knew nothing about Apollo 8. So I went home and I started reading about it. And... Within 15 or 20 minutes, I knew that uh, this was the greatest space story of all time. And uh, it was man's first journey to the moon, the first time mankind ever left our home. Um, but I wasn't the only one who thought it was the greatest space story uh, of all time. So many of the other astronauts seemed to think so too, including Neil Armstrong, who spoke reverentially when he talked about Apollo 8. Um, and when you listen to him talk about it, it sounded um, from his tone and from the look on his face that he believed Apollo 8 to be even a bigger leap for mankind than stepping on the moon itself. And so I had to know more about the story. This was the first time, as I said, mankind ever left home and arrived at another world, a new world, uh, the moon, our most ancient companion, um, a place that had been calling to us since our the beginning of our uh, evolution. And so... Everything I started to find out about Apollo 8 seemed more incredible than the last. The dangers, um, the risks, the, the hurried uh, nature of the thing, the space race, the year in which it took place, it all seemed the most perfect and incredible story I'd ever come across. And so that's how it started. And yeah, it is, and of course it was, uh, we don't think about it because it was overshadowed by Apollo 11, which was only eight months later, right? Yeah, Apollo 11 came um, in mid-1969, and so when man walked on the moon, uh, that was uh, extremely exciting, and Apollo 8 sort of faded into the background, at least it did among the general public. I mean, to this day, you talk to any astronaut or any 
person uh, at NASA who had been involved in it. And they'll tell you that Apollo 8 was probably the most important and risky and uh, uh, powerful space mission of them all. But um, once Apollo 11 happened, and then, of course, Apollo 13, uh, Apollo 8 sort of faded into the background. And today, uh, remains overlooked by some people. And that is a tragedy because, um, to me, as I said, I think it is the most important space mission of them all. And uh, in my opinion, one of the greatest explorations in human history. And so to write this book, you spoke to all three of the astronauts who are all three living, who uh, were on the um, the mission, Frank Borman, Bill Anders, and Jim Lovell. Um, and you also spoke to two other wives. Uh, you spoke to three other wives. One, Susan Borman, is is in the hospital, has Alzheimer's, but you did speak to her and, and learned a lot from her. I almost felt like after reading this, like Susan needs her own book. All three of the wives need their own book or movie or TV series because <laughs> their yes. stories are amazing. Um, and uh, just the, their pearl necklaces and their outfits. I mean, you just got <laughs> so far beyond that to how they were feeling. And what, one little tidbit in this is that they're the only three, uh, the only mission of three astronauts who are still all married to their wives. That's right. Astronaut life was very, very difficult on uh, families and on wives especially, uh, the risks these guys were taking were immense. They were away from home almost the entire week, every week, at, week after week. And uh, the wives had often been with their husbands during the uh, their military careers also and had seen over and over colleagues die in uh, plane crashes. And so this was a terribly stressful kind of thing for the women. And yet um, these women were heroic, every bit as heroic as the men really in holding down uh, their homes and their families and making it very easy for the husbands to concentrate on the job at hand. These guys went to work um, believing that their home life and their wives and children were absolutely taken care of and were fine. And whatever stresses were endured by these women were hidden from the men and that they considered the women considered that part of their duty. And so it was uh, incredible for me to find out just how important the wives were to the missions and the, to the Apollo 8 mission uh, in particular. And that Apollo 8 alone among the Apollo crews and the Gemini crews were the only crew that um, survived with their marriages intact. So even today, um, Borman and Lovell, 90 years old, and uh, Anders, 84 years old, still married to their uh, high school sweethearts, their childhood sweethearts. So uh, this happened 50 years ago, 1968. Um, just to give us a feel about uh, what was going on. It was a big year. Um, it was also sort of a deadline, right? I mean, Kennedy had said by the end of this decade, the 60s, we're going to get a man to the moon. Um, so they were running out of time uh, for this. So talk a little bit about the the 1968, what was going on during that time? Well, there are two kinds of things going on in 1968. There's what's going on at NASA, and then there's what's going on in the rest of the country, and both are intertwined inextricably. At NASA, in 1968, uh, the lunar module, the spidery landing craft that is designed to shuttle astronauts from the orbiting command module down to the lunar surface and back again, that's what we need for a lunar landing, is plagued by design and production problems, and it's threatening to stall the entire Apollo program in mid-1968. And that's a big problem for several reasons, one of which is that President Kennedy has made this promise, this crazy promise in 1961, to land uh, Americans on the moon and return them safely by the end of the decade. And now, you know, we only have a year and a half to go, less even. Um, to, to fulfill that promise. Uh, the second problem is that we are engaged in uh, an existential battle with the Soviet Union. There's a Cold War going on, and the space race is at the heart of that Cold War. And there's every reason um, to believe that the uh, superpower that delivers men to the moon first will win the space race. And it looks in the summer of 1968 like the Soviet Union is ready to do that. A top secret memo is delivered by the CIA indicating that the Soviets can send men around the moon. They're not going to land them, but they're capable of getting them to the moon by the end of 1968. And that's a disaster. And so something needs to be done in the minds of the great managers at NASA, legends like Chris Kraft and George Lowe. They realize something needs to be done, not just to keep the Apollo program moving, but also to um, best the Soviets at the very end of what's been uh, this uh, space race with existential implications. So for NASA, the pressure is really on in mid-1968 as we come into the summer of 1968. For the rest of the country, 1968 is arguably one of the worst years in the country's history. 
It's um, a year dominated by terrible violence. There's the assassination of Martin Luther King and of Robert Kennedy. We have 15,000 dead Americans in Vietnam. Often 90% or more of the evening newscast is devoted to Vietnam. And we can see for the first time the dying and the suffering and the violence of war in our living rooms. We have a racial divide throughout the country. We have violence in the streets, including here in my hometown of Chicago during the uh, Democratic National Convention and other uh, other times. So it's a terrible year in which Americans seem hopelessly divided against each other, young versus old, Republican versus Democrat. It seems that there's nothing that can bring this country together. And here NASA decides that they're going to try to send men to the moon, the first humans ever, by the end of 1968. And uh, for so many reasons, both technical and set against the backdrop of this terrible year, it seems like a crazy idea. Yeah, it, it it Vietnam. You bring up Vietnam. That's really interesting. You um, for your book launch, you spoke you spoke to uh, at the Museum of Science and Industry with all of uh, these three astronauts, mm-hmm. and one of them said, you know, it's hard to 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 feel like it was a real risk when so many of their friends were over in Vietnam, like really risking their lives. Um, so just the difference between what it was like to be in Vietnam and then be shot up into space where, you know, and not knowing if you're going to come back or not, um, both seem pretty dangerous to me. Very dangerous. And you could see every night Americans dying. So the astronauts, um, every one of them that I talked to, not just the crew of Apollo 8, but all the astronauts I spoke to considered um, the real heroes to be those who were fighting on the ground in in the air in Vietnam and who were coming home dead every day. Uh, to go to the moon seemed to them a, par- uh, a bargain in, in many uh, respects. Um, but you have to remember also that these astronauts are wired differently from the rest of us. They have, uh, as, as I see it, a different kind of DNA. And so risk to them is different from risk to the rest of us. And uh, thank goodness for that, because who else would climb atop a 363-foot rocket um, with the power of a small atomic bomb that had never been flown with men aboard and had failed in only its second and most recent test and, and set course for the moon? You have to ask uh, for a different kind of human being to engage in that kind of uh, proposition. And of course, there was the the fire in uh, in the Apollo. Just was it a year earlier that they that the three astronauts had died in on the launch pad? Yeah, about a year and a half earlier, there was a terrible tragedy uh, on Apollo One during a test. They weren't even lifting off; they were on the launch pad, and a fire broke out in the command module. And uh, even Ed White, who was recognized as probably the strongest of all the astronauts, could not open the hatch of the command module, and all three astronauts perished inside. And that alone could have stalled or even stopped the Apollo program. Uh, NASA persevered and, and saw it through, but it was another reminder, and not just to the astronauts, but certainly to their wives and families, of just what could go wrong uh, in a program that aimed so spectacularly for something nobody had ever tried before. And so, so what was the general public's uh, thought of the risk at the time? One of the people in our chat room, Loca- Loquacious, says uh, she was a teen at the time in 1968 and does not remember knowing that there was any real risk. Um, was that were, were they downplaying the risks to the public? Well, no, I don't think they downplayed the risks to the public, but I don't think they advertised them so openly either. Um, it was very clear just from the tragedy of the Apollo 1 fire uh, what the risks were. Here, the guys weren't even launching, and three of them lost their lives. Uh, so there's terrible uh, risk and terrible unknowns involved in the whole thing. Uh, NASA never denied it, um, but I don't think they went out of their way to say just how dangerous these things were. Um, it was very important for NASA to have the public behind them. The space program was extremely expensive. And at the time in 1968, it lit everybody's imagination. So I think they did all they could to keep people feeling good about it. So you wrote in your book, there's a quote from the Washington Post, uh, which says, uh, as the men in the space program consider Apollo 8, they must not allow anyone's desire to beat the Russians or to get around the moon by the end of 1968 or to fan public interest in the future of space exploration to enter into their calculations. But it seems like it really did. I think it did. Um, There will be people who argue that Uh, The space race didn't have quite as much to do with it. But when you talk to the astronauts and to the NASA managers, they they all recognized that this was about beating the Soviets. Frank Borman, who was the commander of Apollo 8 and considered one of NASA's finest, 
um, will tell you straight out, this was only about beating the Russians. It wasn't about picking up moon rocks or doing this in the name of science or in the or to advance the cause of uh, Velcro or Tang. Uh, it was only about beating the Russians. That's the way he saw it. He was a military man. He believed in the uh, military aspect of the mission. And that's why these guys believed they were going. And once it became apparent that the uh, Soviets had the capability and the intention of going as early as late 1968, that set Apollo 8 onto a much different course than it had been planned for originally. So I, I know they, they didn't have a lunar lander they, because they weren't landing on the moon. That was part of how they could get up so fast. Um, but the, the lunar lander was what saved the astronauts later on Apollo 13. So, so what, were, what was the risk of not having the lunar lander? Well, you touched on one of the primary risks for the entire mission. They are going to orbit the moon 10 times over the uh, course of 20 hours. So they're not going to land. And for that reason, they're leaving behind the troubled lunar module. But the idea is brilliant. It's an epiphany because by going, they can learn all about uh, lunar travel and about the moon and scout a landing site, do all kinds of preparation for the ultimate lunar landing without landing themselves. But as you note so correctly, that means they're going without a lunar module. And the lunar module has a backup purpose. Um, and that is as a backup engine in case anything goes wrong on the primary engine of the spacecraft. So if anything goes wrong for the astronauts at the moon and they cannot relight that engine or the engine malfunctions or doesn't perform correctly, they could be stranded in lunar orbit, crash into the lunar surface or fly off into eternal solar orbit. Um, so everything has to function properly and there's no redundancy in this engine. And as you so poignantly point out, this is exactly the thing that saves Apollo 13 two years later. They have a, a redundant backup engine that Apollo 8 goes without. And it's just one of the myriad risks that Apollo 8 is taking that future flights wouldn't take. And when you listen to these other astronauts and NASA legends talk about it, that's part of what they're speaking of when they speak so reverentially about Apollo 8, that so much was being done for the first time. And they're going without redundancy. They're flying the Saturn V for the first time with men aboard. And uh, everything is for the first time. Yeah, I mean, so much of this is about courage, um, which is kind of a cliche, but when you really think of it in terms of what they were doing, um, you write about all, all of their, their childhood, all three of these men's childhood, and Jim Lavelle's, uh, you, you talk about a quote from Robert Goddard, who he was a fan of, and said, every vision is a joke until the first man accomplishes it. Once realized, it becomes commonplace. So, you know, it's just like, do you do you see that now when people are talking about like we're going to send someone to Mars like and everyone's like ha 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 we'll never get there like is there equivalent uh, to, to that now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you love to hear human beings dream big. In fact, dream of the impossible, and a lot of people will downplay a lot of the plans that human beings have. Um, but you have to be real careful to distinguish what really is possible and what's not possible. The thing that uh, seems different to me about these days is that we are not facing this existential enemy the same way we were in the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. I think our belief that our very existence as a country and as a people depended on beating the Soviet Union allowed us to um, push into places and do things that might otherwise have been impossible. And what I wonder is whether we can do continue to do the impossible without that kind of um, fear uh, for our very existence. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, we need we need a, a bigger enemy, I guess. <laughs> um, and another big risk was the that the training was abbreviated. Talk a little bit about that. Right. Ordinary space missions took 12 to 18 months to prepare for. That's for astronaut training and for the engineers to work out all the technical details for software to be built and tested and so many other things. So you're looking at 12 to 18 months normally. When the epiphany for Apollo 8's mission came by uh, George Lowe, this phenomenal, brilliant uh, manager at NASA, there was only four months left before uh, the, the launch window would close. So Apollo 8 was going to go on four months of preparation. Um, in early August, the mission did not exist for Apollo 8. Apollo 8 was originally planned as a low Earth orbital checkout mission. Four months later, on December 21st, 1968, they were going to launch for the moon. And they weren't just going to fly around the moon and come back like the Soviets had been planning. They were going to go into lunar orbit 10 
revolutions over 20 hours, incredibly complicated, incredibly daring and, and bold and so, so risky. Uh, but that was the plan with only four months time. And it was over Christmas. Was it in, intended to be over Christmas or was that just, it had to be then they wanted to get it in before the end of 68? No, I think they wanted to get it in before the end of 68, and that was the last possible launch window. It happened to put them around the moon on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And uh, to give you an idea of what that meant and how it wasn't planned for Christmas, when James Webb, the head of all of NASA, first heard the plan for Apollo 8, he said, and this is a quote, are you out of your mind? <laughs> And he pointed out all the risks and the firsts that would be encountered in the rush to the launch pad. But he noted something that nobody had really thought about before. And that was, he said, if something happens to these three men at the moon, no one, lovers, poets, no one will ever look at the moon the same again. And nobody had thought about that. But it was true also of Christmas. Because think about what would have happened if these men had crashed into the lunar surface or perished at Christmas. Who would ever look at Christmas the same? So it was a tremendous risk, not just technologically, but spiritually almost, that they were going to do this. And I reproduce a letter in the book sent by a man in Connecticut begging NASA, don't do this. This has been such a terrible year already. We cannot take a disaster at the moon, which is one of the most beautiful elements to our existence. And Christmas, which is that one moment of peace and togetherness we have in this horrible year. How could you risk all this at the moon at Christmas? And yet this was the time NASA decided to go. So was there one person that you think really pushed it or was it was it many people that got this mission? Obviously the astronauts themselves, but to make to, to give the go ahead to, to actually do it. Who who do you think or what group of people do you think are responsible for that? Well, you have to look first and foremost at George Lowe, who was uh, this brilliant, quiet man at NASA who had the respect of everybody and who came up with this plan. It was his epiphany to go without the lunar module and accomplish everything so that they could keep the Apollo program moving and, and learn everything about lunar travel, save for the, the lunar landing itself. Lowe then went to Chris Kraft, one of the great legends um, of the space of American space program, the mastermind of uh, mission control and craft after an initial um, breath to, to digest all this was on board. And then they got everybody. Uh, so you had uh, Robert Gilruth, uh, Phillips there. You had Werner von Braun, um, who was in charge of the rockets, the, the lead rocket designer. So almost everybody at NASA jumped on board almost immediately. They could see the beauty and the um, and the profound insight of this plan. They all recognized that it uh, required um, tremendous risk, but they could see the beauty of it. If Apollo 8 could succeed, um, the Apollo program could be kept moving. Kennedy's promise uh, and deadline would be kept alive. And as a bonus, they could beat the Soviets to the moon. They just had to find a crew willing to take on this risk and uh, a beautiful crew, so, you know, a crew that um, they could trust to do this. And that's what they found in Borman, Lovell, and Anders. Well, I want to talk more about the um, about the three astronauts and their wives and the interviews that you had with them. And of course, the iconic Earthrise photo that was taken. Um, but first, I want to take a second to thank our sponsor. I want to thank Ring, the Ring Video Doorbell. They are the sponsor of this show. I have a Ring Doorbell. My parents have a Ring video doorbell. I love that they have it because it makes them feel safer and they know whenever I'm coming over their house uh, to watch TV, which I often do that. The Ring is a great uh, tool. I know you've probably already heard about it, but I want you to really consider uh, more about it. It will help make your neighborhood safer and the Ring video doorbell lets you see and speak to intruders on your smartphone because who doesn't want to speak to an intruder? I know I do. You can be anywhere. You can even share video clips with neighbors using the Ring app. So if one of your neighbors comes over and keeps picking your lemons, you can show them the video. I caught you. Please don't take my lemons. You can also check out Ring's Twitter feed. They have some great clips of the Ring video doorbell in action. Of course, you can see people stealing your stuff, but you can also see really a lot of other stuff. Uh, one thing, if, you, here's, you can, if you're listening to this, you can hear the hail and the rain that's coming through on the Ring video doorbell. Because I know if you've ever like been on vacation and every, all your neighbors say, it was hailing while you were gone. And you say, no, couldn't possibly have been hailing. But now if you have Ring video doorbell, 
you can see the hail. It's pretty cool. So check out their Twitter feed because they have a lot of uh, interesting little videos there. Let me tell you about Ring's floodlight and spotlight cam that will let you uh, build a whole ring of security around your entire property. Just like Ring's video doorbell, the floodlight cam is a motion activated camera and the floodlight connects to your phone. You have high visibility floodlights, HD video, two-way audio, lets you know the moment anyone steps on your property. You can see and speak to visitors. You can even set off an alarm right from your phone. When things go bump in the night, you'll immediately know what it is. Ring floodlight cams offer the ultimate in home security. Thieves just can't hide with the ring. Monitor every corner of your property with the ring of security kit, which includes a ring video doorbell. And then you get to choose either one, two, or three floodlight cams, depending on the space that you're putting them in. And connect your ring video doorbell with your favorite smart locks and hubs for added convenience, monitoring, and security. Stop crime before it happens and help make your neighborhood safer with ring. Save up to $150 on a ring of security kit at ring.com slash triangulation. That's ring.com slash triangulation. $150 off. All you have to do is go to ring.com slash triangulation. I am talking to Robert Curson. He is the author of Rocket Men, which is a great summer read. If you like history, if you love space, um, it's a great book. Uh, and I'm so excited to talk to him. And we've been talking about Frank Borman, Bill Anders, and Jim Lovell. Um, and so, so when you first reached out to them, were, what was their response? Were they, were they interested in talking to you about this? Uh, how did your first uh, contact with them go? Well, I was very lucky. Jim Lovell lives about 20 minutes away from me here in Chicago. And I got hold of his uh, email address and wrote him uh, a note saying that I was very interested in this and that the excitement I encountered when first discovering Apollo 8 at the Museum of Science and Industry was overwhelming to me. And I would love to talk to him. And I was very lucky that when he wrote back, he said he had been a fan of my first book, Shadow Divers, mm -hmm. about the U-boat, and in fact had listened to it on audiobook and uh, had found himself orbiting the parking lot of the restaurant uh, he and his son owned, uh, listening to uh, the end of chapters. And that was thrilling for me, the idea of Jim Lovell orbiting, listening to my work. But it, it helped me because he knew that um, I had uh, published a, a book that he had enjoyed and that, and I was close. I could be there in you know 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And so he invited me to come talk to him. And I told him that you know I haven't read a lot yet. This was I was just a few days into my research, but I was already convinced Apollo 8 was the the greatest space mission of them all. And we took it from there. And once I spent some time with him, he was kind enough to make phone calls to Frank Borman and Bill Anders, and they invited me. Um, out to their homes. And I ended up spending a lot of time in person with all three of the crew members, both in person and on the phone to put the book together. And the, you know, these are the men that they read, they read Jules Verne. They went to see Westerns on the weekends. It's just, um, you know, it's, it's beautiful portraits of their, their childhood. Um, did you, uh, and, and you talked to their wives. So what was the sense of risk uh, that, that the wives felt? Um, did, did they, did they expect their husbands to come home? Well, it's interesting because each of the three wives had a very different take on this. Um, Marilyn Lovell trusted uh, that Jim would come home. He never uh, burdened her with uh, the dangers or the risks. And I think that she just trusted that everything would be okay. And he made it very easy on her. Um, Bill Anders was very straight with his wife, Valerie. Um, the day he got the assignment, he told her, that he uh, assessed the risks as follows. He thought there was a one-third chance of a successful mission, a one-third chance that the mission was a bust, but that he would somehow return safely to Earth, and a one-third chance that the astronauts wouldn't return at all. And Valerie, who's a very, very bright woman and very interested in technology and space and astronomy, uh, assessed those as pretty decent risks. And she too understood that guys were dying in Vietnam every day and that that was a reasonable risk to take for a mission that she believed in completely. Susan Borman had a much different reaction. Uh, Susan had been very close friends with Pat White, the wife of Ed White, one of the three astronauts who died in the Apollo 1 fire. And since that fire, she had seen Pat White come apart emotionally, as you might understand. And Susan herself began to come apart. Uh, she, Frank didn't know it, but Susan had begun drinking at that 
point, she uh, hit it perfectly from Frank. It was her duty, she believed, to make his life and his job as easy as possible. But she became convinced as the months rolled on, and certainly then as the uh, Apollo 8 was changed to a lunar mission, that Frank was going to die. She believed it with 100% certainty, not more likely than not, not probably, but absolutely 100% certain Frank was going to die on Apollo 8. And it was brutal for her. She suffered terribly. Again, she never showed any of it to Frank. And he would tell me later, if he had any idea she was suffering like that, he would have taken whatever steps he could have taken to help her. But she just made her family and the home appear perfect, as she believed was her her mission. And so she was suffering terribly, so much so that once when she had a conversation with Chris Kraft at a cocktail party and asked him what he thought the chances of Apollo 8 coming home were, um, he believed her to be asking what the chances of a, po- of a successful mission were, and he said 50-50. But believe- she believed him to be saying Frank had a 50-50 chance of living, mm. and she was thrilled with that. She was very happy to hear that he had only that he had as much as a 50-50 chance, but that soon wore off, and she again came to believe that he was going to die on the mission. And she was so convinced of it that during the flight, she composed his eulogy. Um, she didn't want to take the chance that anyone at NASA was going to do it wrong, and because she knew he was going to die on the flight, she started to write it out herself. It's amazing. I mean, you think about today, the invasions of privacy, but when you look at all those photos of them, you know, watching the launch, like with their children, hands over their face, I mean, the, it's hard to believe there are cameras right in their faces as they're uh, experiencing this. Absolutely. These women are absolute heroes as much as the men. They took on so much burden. And to have... Um, the media's cameras, not just in their faces, but in their homes. There are some shots I have uh, from the embedded life photographer in their homes that are as intimate as you can get. I mean, in moments just before the flight where the, the astronauts are holding hands or kissing their children goodbye. And these women had to endure it all and to be kind to the throngs of reporters who were on their lawns. They would bring them hot coffee during the cold mornings. Uh, it was their job, they believed, um, to make everything as easy as possible for their husbands and to make NASA look as good as possible. And while their husbands were doing something no humans had ever done before, taking risks and encountering dangers no one had ever contemplated, really, they were holding down the fort. So uh, the families looked perfectly intact. And so so was it difficult for the, the wives to talk about this time? I know they're like little, um, uh, you thank them in the acknowledgments, thank them for, for letting you ask these personal questions. Um, so, you know, little things about you know, Marilyn saying she went over to Susan's house and Susan didn't come out of the bedroom and she felt hurt. Like, were there, um, was, it, was it hard for them to relive this, these times? I don't think so. I think they're very proud of what happened. And they just, in the same way that the astronauts viewed the trip to the moon as their jobs. The women viewed um, holding down the fort as their jobs, and they were happy to recount it and to talk about it, and also to have Apollo 8 recognized, because as we said, it's been somewhat overlooked, even though it really is, again, as I think, the greatest mission of them all. And I think the wives believed that from the start, that this was something very, very special. And I think they were happy to talk about it, and very, very honest in the uh, an expression of uh, how difficult it could be emotionally at times. So one of the things that came out of this mission was the Earthrise photo. That's the iconic photo um, that uh, has been used uh, for so many different reasons. And and one one thing you point out in the book is that it really may, might have launched the environmental movement because it was the first time we could see Earth uh, from a distance and see how fragile Earth looks. Right. Among the many, many firsts that occurred during Apollo 8 was that we saw Earth as a whole sphere, a whole planet for the first time. And part of what went into Apollo 8's incredibly condensed training for those four months was uh, photography. It fell to Bill Anders to be the primary photographer, and he uh, trained as hard as he could to photograph the moon. It was all about the moon. But here they come to the moon, and they're on their fourth revolution. And Borman changes the attitude of the spacecraft. So now that the guys are looking over the lunar landscape and there's nothing but gray, the lunar landscape is endless gray and over it, uh, the black infinity of outer space. Those are the only two colors in the universe, the gray of the moon and the blackness of outer space. And suddenly, and it surprised all three of them, rising just over 
the lunar horizon is this beautiful speck of blue and they're shocked and it rises further and it's the only color in the entire universe. And they know immediately, of course, this is Earth rising over the lunar horizon. And they rush for their cameras. In all the training they did, they never expected to uh, photograph the Earth like this. So Borman has a black and white camera and he manages to fire off the first shot. And if you go on YouTube and listen to the radio transmissions of this moment, you can hear the um, the awe in their voice. They are um, uh, dumbstruck at the beauty of the whole thing and, and never expected to see this. And, and Earth is rising before their eyes. And Anders gets um, a long telephoto lens and a color magazine of film. And he fires these images that you showed, um, the first Earthrise ever witnessed by mankind. And in a few moments, it's all over. But they realize that they have witnessed something um, deeply profound, and each man on the spot is really changed by it. And they talk to me at length about what it meant to see that, what um, it meant to see everything that they loved, everything that meant anything to them, everything they knew and recognized was on that beautiful blue marble hanging in this blackness that went on forever. And that uh, how important it was um, that we're all one person, all the strife and, and violence of that year, they're looking at this one planet and they, they cannot recognize continents at that point. It's just one entity and it affects them very deeply. And Bill Anders told me that it struck him as he put away his camera, that they'd come all this way to find the moon. And yet what they'd really done was discovered the earth. And uh, each man was changed by that moment forever. It's amazing that it wasn't planned, that it was just like, oh, there's the Earth. <laughs> right. It's it, You would think that they'd say you're going to be seeing the first Earth rise ever, but this was not what it was about. They uh, had to cram so much into these four months, and it was really all about the moon and getting ready for the lunar landing, that nobody ever bothered to talk to them about Earth rise. And it was incredible to them and uh, and deeply moving. You talk about how uh, they use sextants and telescopes to measure the angles between the stars and the horizon in order to travel. Is that, uh, are any of those tools still used today um, in the space tr travel that that is going on? You know, I'm not sure that they're used today. That's a good question. I should have asked that. But it amazed me that they were used even back then because in, you know, these are some of the same kinds of instruments and technologies that they were using hundreds of years ago on sailing ships. And, you know, when I mentioned that to Lovell, he laughed and said, that's right. So some of the techniques from you know, centuries ago were being were the foundation of how they located themselves among the stars. So we haven't been back to the moon since 1972, 74? All right, 72, yeah. 72. Um, so why, why do you think we haven't traveled back to the moon? Well, I think that once we won the space race, and the space race really was uh, won by Apollo 8 by getting the first men to the moon and certainly by Apollo 11, the first landing on the moon. Uh, a lot of that existential um, fear that we had about losing the space race dissipated. Also, the space program was extraordinarily expensive. And if you can believe it, it seems hard to say now, uh, almost impossible to believe, but the American public started to get kind of bored by lunar landings by the time of Apollo 17, which was the last one. It doesn't seem like it would be boring now at all. I can't imagine, but it, believe it or not, that's what happened. So the combination of uh, a lesser threat from the Soviet Union, the great expense that the space program required, and kind of our jadedness about it all sort of conspired to put the money elsewhere and do other things. And it just seems impossible that it's been this long uh, but it, it has been since then, since we've ever come close to putting people on the moon again. I'm told uh, by someone in the chat room, Osned, that sextants were used on the space shuttle. So I haven't confirmed that, but I believe her. So, <laughs> and then of Wouldn't course, surprise me. Yeah, this the space shuttle again when the when the when the space shuttle exploded. That was another time when everyone was like, "Oh, we had become bored with this amazing thing we're doing." Yeah, you could come to take this for granted, things keep going well and going well, um, you start to think it's routine. And of course, it's nothing but 
it's anything but routine. Um, but uh, and that's when accidents can happen, apparently. Mm. Uh, but the uh, the you would think that the technology and the computing power um, today would make it so much easier to get to the moon, and maybe it would. But I don't think we're anywhere close to doing it, at least to landing men on the moon. Mm-hmm. So, uh, did you talk to the astronauts about what they thought about the the space shuttle program, and you know what, what's going on now uh, with you know, possibly space tourism or SpaceX reusable rockets? Did you guys talk about any of uh, of the present day uh, space travel? I did, and I think the three uh, crewmen from Apollo Eight are unanimous in their belief that Mars is not as realistic a goal, at least not now, as some people like to believe. I think all three would prefer that uh, any energy and expense that went into traveling in space be uh, directed toward lunar um, expeditions and building a lunar base, that kind of thing. I think all three of them are highly suspect of our ability to go to Mars uh, to survive the radiation and the length of time it would take to get there. That's too bad. (laughs) <laughs> but it is, you know, it is one of those things where you, where you think, well, we could get there. But um, yeah, I and I don't, I'm not sure if Elon Musk is the guy to get us there. He has sort of a different, um, uh, he, he's he's a little bit different than these astronauts, as you've described yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what what else can uh I, you talk about some really interesting, there's so many stories in here. I don't, I don't want to give them away. You should read it. Um, but I mean, you, not you, but anyone listening or watching should read it. What what uh, what was anything else? Have we, have we missed anything else about the book that, um, that we, you feel like people should know? Well, one of the things that shocked me was that um, when, Apo- when the Apollo 8 mission was finalized and given the green light at NASA, they realized that... Um, they needed to take television cameras because this was so momentous. Uh, They needed to broadcast back to the world what was going on. And so they planned for four television broadcasts, the third of which was going to happen on Christmas Eve. And NASA soon realized that more people would be listening to the astronauts' voices than had ever listened to a human voice at once in history. Nearly a third of the world's population, they estimated, would tune into this. And to that end, they told Frank Borman, say something appropriate. And to this day, Borman, who's 90 now, still laughs when he remembers being given that direction because it was no direction at all. He said today it would have to go through 16 committees and probably up to the White House and get approval and censors and and focus groups before they allowed the astronauts to take the kind of risk that they were willing to let Borman, Lovell and Anders take. They just told them, say something appropriate and left it at that. So the uh, three astronauts started to try to think what would be appropriate for mankind's first journey to the, a new world, first arrival at the moon, um, that would speak to everybody in the world, not just to a few people or, or one group of people. And they just couldn't come up with anything suitable. And so Borman took it to a literary sensitive man he knew, uh, and that man couldn't come up with it. That man went to someone else he knew who he thought would be a good person. That man couldn't come up with it. But at about 2.30 in the morning in that second man's bedroom with uh, all kinds of crumpled up pieces of paper all over the floor from failed attempts, that man's wife walked in and asked what's going on. And he explained the problem. And she immediately knew what would be appropriate to say to the world during this momentous occasion. She told her husband he thought that's perfect. It was communicated back to Borman. As soon as he heard it, he thought it was perfect. He told his crewmates they believed it was perfect. It was written down on fireproof paper, put in the flight plan, and nobody ever thought about it after that. The, the astronauts didn't tell their wives. They didn't tell any other astronauts. They just kept it to themselves. And so here comes this third broadcast. It's being done on Christmas Eve as Apollo 8 is orbiting the moon, and nearly a third of the world's population is tuned in. And the astronauts are explaining what they're seeing, what craters they're flying over, how their trip has been. And then with a a couple minutes left to go, they say that they have a message to deliver back to Earth. And Bill Anders begins to read the first lines from the book of Genesis. Now approaching uh, lunar sunrise. I guess we're listening to that. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8, has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. 
They was good. And divided the light from the darkness. So the wives the wives tell this story. The wives made this <laughs> <laughs> well, someone's wife, not, not one of the astronauts' wife, uh, someone else's wife came up with it. But here the guys are reading uh, an origin story that speaks to so many of the world's peoples. And grown men inside NASA, men who are about engineering and numbers and hard details, a breakdown into tears, but they're not the only ones. It happens all across the world. People in homes, in bars, uh, walking around, all uh, are reduced to tears. The astronauts are speaking to the world, a unified world. And when Borman reads the last lines and they wish um, a Merry Christmas to everyone on the good earth, people from all over the world stream out from wherever they were and they look skyward, hoping to see Apollo 8, knowing they'll never see it, but hoping just the same. This was a message um, with a, a distinct power and a unifying force that uh, human beings had never heard before. Um, when Apollo 8 launched on December 21st of 1968, Time magazine had already named the dissenter as its man of the year. By the time Apollo 8 returned on December 27th, it had changed to the crew of Apollo 8. That's an honor they wouldn't even bestow on Apollo 11, the first lunar landing. So you could see what it meant to people. And when Apollo 8 got back, um, they were honored um, with several ticker tape parades, millions of people showed up in various cities, including here in Chicago, to honor them. Hundreds of thousands of uh, letters and telegrams arrived for them. The astronauts couldn't read them all, but they remembered one of them, a telegram that arrived from an anonymous person uh, in the Midwest. It was only four words long, but they never forgot it to this day. And it said, thanks, you saved 1968. Mm -hmm. And that's how Apollo 8 ended. That's amazing. I want to talk about a little bit about your other books, um, but f first I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor. I wanted to thank FreshBooks for helping us make this episode possible. If you have your own business, you know the most annoying thing is billing all your clients. You want to be doing your business, whatever it is, writing, photography, juggling, whether you're a clown, whatever you do on the side, whatever your hustle is, you don't want to spend time with Word and Excel messing with that and billing clients. You don't have to with FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the ridiculously easy cloud accounting software. You can streamline your business with FreshBooks, the easy to use cloud accounting software built specifically for you, for you, the small business owner. Quickly access spending, outstanding balances, total profit, and other accounting reports right in the FreshBooks dashboard. You can send professional looking invoices in just seconds. Keep tabs on your business no matter where you are with the FreshBooks mobile app. You can get that on your Android phone or your iOS. Put it on your iPad or your iPhone. Wherever you are, you can have the app there. FreshBooks automatically connects to your bank account and updates expenses every single day. Import expenses in bulk with the CSV file import option or take a picture of receipt, upload it, and let FreshBooks do the rest. Like I said, it's ridiculously easy. Manage team member rates from the My Team page and add team members as business partner, basic employee, or contractor, depending on which permissions you want to grant each team member. Non-invoice income, like online sales and ads, can now be tracked by logging them in the other income section. And with FreshBooks, there's no need to chase clients for payment, accept online payments directly from your invoice and get paid an average of two times faster. See what invoices have been sent, viewed and paid, as well as overdue and outstanding invoice totals. Bill for time for by client and by specific project. You can send invoices, estimates and proposals. You can send them in Spanish, in Dutch, in German, even Portuguese. From payment reminders to late fees, automate as much or as little as you want. Join the 10 million people using FreshBooks to painlessly send invoices, track time, and capture expenses, and get back to doing what you love. Try FreshBooks free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash triangulation. Enter triangulation in the how did you hear about us section. That's freshbooks.com slash triangulation. If the only thing that is keeping you from that side hustle you've been thinking about is the all the work of billing and invoicing and tracking. Don't think about that. Just try fresh books and then become a clown or whatever it is that you want to do. I am talking to Robert Curson. He is the author of Rocket Men, the true story of Apollo 8. You can pick it up in bookstores. You can listen to the audiobook. If you don't believe me, listen to a sample of the audiobook on Audible. You will be hooked, I promise. 
So you have uh, had many books. Your, your best-selling book is Shadow Divers, which we talked a little bit about. But tell us a little bit um, more and, and how you were inspired to write that book. Well, that was just a lucky break. A friend of mine called and said, um, you have to turn on PBS Nova. There's a story about these two recreational scuba divers who found a U-boat in New Jersey waters, 230 feet down with 56 dead sailors inside. And I thought, let me see if I can think of three subjects I'm any less interested in than scuba diving, <laughs> U-boats, and uh, World War II German naval warfare. But I watched, and it was a phenomenal uh a documentary. It was a two-hour special on Nova, and it was beautifully done. But I kept waiting for them to say, why are these two guys risking their lives? Because they were taking amazing risks. They watched three of their friends die, searching for the, uh, trying to identify this wreck. Uh, they lost their uh, marriages. They lost all their money, and they nearly lost their lives many times. And I kept waiting for the documentary to explain why would two guys risk so much for what appeared to be just a footnote in history. But the documentary never really addressed that. So when it was over, I called one of the divers, John Chatterton, and asked if I could meet him. Uh, I flew out to New Jersey the next day, met him and Richie Kohler, the two principal divers who were engaged in this odyssey, a six-year odyssey to solve the mystery of this wreck. And, you know, I expected to stay an hour or two. Thirteen hours later, I was still listening to this story, and I thought, this is the greatest story I've ever heard. The men truly believed their souls were uh, on the line here, that... This was a chance a diver would be given once in many lifetimes if he was lucky and that they were going to know themselves uh, truly by how they acquitted themselves in the search. And it was just the most incredible adventure. And it literally came down to one of the diver's last breaths. Uh, in the same way a diver could go many lifetimes and never get a chance to find and identify a virgin German U-boat, a writer could go many lifetimes and never find a story that great to tell. So that was uh, just an incredibly lucky break for me. And that became my first book, Shadow Divers. And uh, Pirate Hunters, was that the next one or was there one in between? There was one in between called Crashing Through, which was a true story of a man who'd been blind for life, who was offered a rare stem cell transplant surgery that would uh, give him vision. And you would think that vision after a lifetime of blindness would be the single greatest thing that could ever happen to a human being. But in fact, it turns out to be about the worst. Um, there were only 15 known cases before this man from California had his vision restored. In all 15 of those cases, going back, I think, to the year 600 AD, the results were disastrous emotionally and psychologically for the patient. You had clawing at the eyes, suicide attempts, fury at the surgeon who'd given the patient vision. And it turns out that there are fascinating reasons, uh, mind-boggling reasons why this is true. But this is the only living person um, to whom this has happened. And that's about the, uh, who the book is about, about how this person had a much different outcome than his 15 predecessors, but not without massive uh, effort and pitfalls and uh, incredibly dramatic uh, developments. And then you went back to the sea for Pirate Hunters. Back to the Sea for Pirate Hunters, which is about the discovery of the only the second known pirate ship, Golden Age pirate ship ever. Turns out that finding a pirate ship is probably the most difficult thing to find in all the universe. Uh, until 2009, only one had ever been found and positively identified. And Pirate Hunters is a story of the discovery of the second. But the second is a great pirate ship. It's, and it's not just a great pirate ship. It has maybe the greatest of all the pirate captains, an unknown a previously unknown man named uh, Joseph Bannister, who was a proper English gentleman and a genius, uh, who turned pirate for very complicated, interesting reasons. Uh, and it's his ship that the um, treasure hunters go looking for, uh, almost against all odds. So what are you working on now? Are you, uh, or is it a secret? Oh, I wish I had a secret to tell you. The hardest part of my job is to find a great new true story. And you know, if you write about Apollo 8, um, you know, the first journey to the moon, it's hard to find something to top that. So I'm looking, I'm on my own search, but that is always the hardest part of my job and the scariest part, because you always believe I'll never find another one. And certainly not one as great as Apollo 8. <laughs> well, it seems to you like you just happen upon them. So I'm sure it'll happen again. Well, I'm a greater and greater believer in luck. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that I find something that worthy, a worthy successor to Rocket Men. Well, Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Robert Kirsten is the author of, most recently, Rocket Man, the true story of Apollo 8. 
Um, and you, uh, where's the best place to follow you? Is it robertcurson.com or on Twitter? Yeah, robertcurson.com, uh, K-U-R-S-O-N or Twitter, same handle. And uh, you can find out all about my work and what I'm, what I'm up to there. All right. And you send, send him ideas for the next. Oh, please. I love story. good ideas. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert. So great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Take care. Take care. And thank you for watching Triangulation. Triangulation records every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific, hosted by me, Megan Maroney, Leo Laporte, Jason Howell, and Father Robert Balasar. And you can watch live or you can subscribe to the show. You can go to twit.tv slash try and find all the ways to subscribe. You can watch, you can listen. Uh, we hope that you watch and listen and you can send feedback. I am always open to hearing who you want to see and hear. I love the show, love having long form conversations with people. So if there's someone that you want to hear a long uh, conversation with, email me, Megan at twit.tv. Send me your suggestions and I'll, we'll try to track them down and make them talk to me. We'll see you next week on Triangulation.